how was this building made? It took not just a lot of work, but a lot of planning, a lot of coordination. Somebody sat down and figured out what the design should be. Then somebody figured out how to build it step by step. And then a lot of people were very organized to go through those steps in order until here we are today. That's the way that we're used to thinking about major projects like construction work being done with a lot of very careful planning and organization. But there is another way. This is a tower that was built by termites. These things can be huge. The record is more than 40 feet tall. The proportional human skyscraper would be miles high. Inside, the mound has a complicated network of tunnels. The whole thing is not just protecting the colony, but it's acting to help ventilate it. The way that the termites build the whole thing looks very disorganized compared to what we're used to. Each termite is just doing its own thing. They don't have a blueprint of what they're trying to build. They don't know what the other termites are doing or what the rest of the mound looks like. They're not getting instructions from the queen. In fact, these termites are blind. What's happening is each one is just going around, running into whatever situations it does. Uh, when it does, it does whatever it naturally does in that situation. Uh, so we can think of that as the rules that the termites are following. And those rules are such that all of them acting together wind up building these enormous, complicated structures. That's kind of amazing. So what are these rules, then, that the termites are following? How do they coordinate their work? Well, it turns out that there hasn't been all that much known about it. Termites are actually not that well studied compared to other social insects like ants and bees. And I think there are a few different reasons for that. One is that termites are really not very charismatic animals. <laughs> and our relationship with them tends to be an adversarial one. And so here's a, a book that I found in the Harvard Library. I feel like this really sums things up. But even aside from all of that, the ones that build the amazing mounds, right, the ones that from our standpoint are doing the really uh, interesting thing, they're a pain to study. They don't live around here. You've got to go halfway around the world to find them. And then once you get there, they're living in these impenetrable fortresses. So what do you do? Well, one thing you could try is uh, knock a hole in the mound and put in a camera on a wire and take a look at what's going on inside. But this is not a good way to study them. I mean, this is a mess, right? You've got any number of termites coming and going in ways you can't keep track of. The tunnels are complicated in ways that we can't control. And also, this happens. Within a few minutes after you put anything into the mound, it gets covered in soil. So instead, what we do is we take termites out of the mound, bring them into the lab, and we look at what they do in small groups in controlled conditions. And again, the question that we're trying to study is, what are the things that termites pay attention to when they're deciding what to do? The classic story, the one thing that everyone has thought we know about how termites coordinate since the 1950s is based on the idea of what's called a cement pheromone. So a termite is carrying a blob of soil. The idea is that it adds some chemical to that, uh, this pheromone. And it leaves that there. Later, another termite comes along. Uh, and when it reaches that material, it smells the chemical. And that tells it to put down its own soil, which it's also put more of this chemical into. And so as that continues over time, you wind up getting this accumulation of soil and of this chemical. So that's focusing the termites building in one place. So that's been the understanding for the last 60 years. It's now looking like that's wrong. I mean, it's, it's a great idea. Uh, it's been very productive in a lot of ways. But as things are looking now, in all likelihood, that chemical doesn't actually exist. Instead, we've been finding other things that termites seem to care a lot about when they're deciding where to dig and where to build. One thing is, what is everybody else doing? So if you're a termite walking along and you pass a place where others are digging, the more others who are actively digging there right then, the more you want to go join in with them. Termites are social insects. Right? The, the bigger that digging party, the more you want to be part of it. Another thing they pay attention to is what's the shape of the ground they're standing on. If you're in a bowl, turns out that's a place you would like to dig. If you're on top of a hill, you don't want to spend your time there. And of course, as the termites are digging out soil from some places and putting it in other places, they're changing the shape of the ground that they're standing on. So the environment is affecting what the termites do. And what the termites do is affecting their environment. 
And that's the key, that feedback loop. They're using the environment to coordinate their work. So that means that they don't need to have a boss telling them what to do. They don't need a blueprint or a plan. They don't even need to talk to each other about what they're doing. Uh, the termites are coordinating their activity completely through their changes they're making to their shared environment. And the way that they're making those changes, again, the rules that the termites are following, are such that all of them acting together uh, wind up making progress in ways that are useful for the colony. Now, I keep talking about the termites as following rules. That's a useful way to think about it, but it's an oversimplification. I've, I've been talking about the termites as though they're robots, but they're animals. They're all a bit different. They can be unpredictable. But you know what are robots? Robots. So now I'm going to take a step away from the biology and move a bit toward engineering. So the termites show us that this can be done. Right? They're a demonstration that you can have uh, limited independent agents that act together in large numbers and build these large-scale complex structures. Great. Can we harness that power? Could we create a swarm of robots to build things for us? And we're not trying to copy the termites exactly. Right? We don't need something that's going to build us more termite mounds. We've got about as many of those as we need already. What we want is to be able to program the swarm so that we can ask them for a particular thing that we want built, and they'll go and they'll build us that thing we asked for. And that's typically what we want in human construction projects. So let me say a couple things about the construction industry. This is a huge deal. This is one of the biggest things that people do. It's a trillion dollar industry just in the United States. And it's an industry with almost no automation. Basically everything is done by skilled human workers using powerful machines. That is just starting to change. We're just starting to see automation enter actual construction sites. Now, you compare this to uh, an industry like manufacturing, right? That's been completely transformed by automation. So there's a lot of potential impact, not just in cases where we have ways of building, but in situations where we can't build so easily, but we might like to. If we want to explore or live underwater, if we want to colonize the moon or Mars, Right? These are difficult, expensive, dangerous places to send people. If we could send a swarm of robots on ahead first, you know, they could build a habitat so that when humans show up later, they've got a place to live. That would be a huge step forward. So how should we introduce automation into construction? Well, the traditional view of robotics uh, is to build robots that are like artificial human beings. But I think we should build robots that are like artificial termite colonies. If you can do things this way, there's a lot of potential advantages. Right? If you've got a million robots all working at once, they can get things done much faster than one robot could. If some of these robots happen to break, no big deal. The rest of them can keep working. The ability of the swarm to get the job done isn't affected by the loss of some of its components. But of course, you've also got a huge challenge here. These are all separate robots. Again, we're following the termite model. So each one of these has its own brain. It's got its own ideas about what's going on. It's making its own decisions about what to do. How do you make sure that all of them working together are going to be actually working together? Right? That you don't have one of them over here doing something and another one over here undoing it. If you're not assigning particular jobs to specific robots, if you don't know in advance how many robots you'll have, if you can't know in advance which one is going to be where, doing what, when, how do you make sure that no matter what all of the separate robots decide to do, the whole swarm of them together is working toward your goal, and they're not going to get themselves stuck somehow? Again, we're going to use the termites for inspiration and have the robots coordinate by using their environment. So we give the robots a set of rules that says, as you walk around, look at where material has already been attached. When you see certain patterns, build more. Where you see other patterns, don't build. And we can design those rules and those patterns in such a way that the robots will always keep making progress. They won't be able to block themselves off from a, a place they need to go. They won't start building a wall they can't finish. One of the other things that makes that possible is that all of the robots are following the same rules, which means that the situations that they will typically encounter are limited. So they don't need to be able to deal with every possible thing that could conceivably happen. 
they only need to be able to deal typically with the smaller set of things that will happen when they're following these rules. That makes everyone's lives easier. This is something that we do as human beings all the time. We have shared rules that we've agreed to follow, often arbitrary rules that we've just made up uh, that help things run smoothly. We all drive on the right-hand side of the road. Right? That's an arbitrary choice. Some places, everyone drives on the left side of the road. That works too. As long as we're all following the same rule, that lets us do things like drive fast and safely. So in a similar way, the rules that the termites are following can ensure that the flow of their traffic goes smoothly and the buildup of material goes safely. And the upshot here is that by using these kinds of principles, we can create teams of robots that build like termites. Each of these has its own brain. It only knows what it can see for itself. They're not talking to each other directly about what they're doing. All of their coordination is happening because they're making changes to the same environment. And the rules that they're following are such that even though these robots are limited, even though you don't know in advance how many there will be, you don't know which one is going to wind up encountering what task, at what time, in what place, in what order, all of that is unpredictable. And yet, no matter how the details of that process go, you can be sure that the group all working together will wind up in the end building exactly the thing you asked them to build. <laughs> That's not how we made this building. It's not going to be how we build the next campus project. But it might be how we build the moon base. It might be how you build your dream home. And in that home of the future, termites will be not the instruments of destruction, but of creation. Thank you.